Um, all right, so I do have some slides for you today. So thank you. I originally was um, invited to talk about my research in teaching empathy and self-awareness and using the difficult patient as a present, as a gift, and how that really can be a transformative learning moment. But the scientific committee asked me instead to talk about my story. Um, so I hope uh, that you learn a little bit from my experience um, becoming a physician act activist. And um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my life's journey into medicine and what I've chosen to do. And what I want to impart to all of you, um, especially those of you who are earlier in your career, but really to everyone, that it is really important to find your heart in medicine and in your journey and to follow your passion and what, and what you really care about. Um, and just to get an idea, how many of you are medical students? Okay. How many residents? Few. How many physicians? Okay. And are there big categories of other people here? Pre-meds. Oh, how many of you are pre-meds? That's even better. Okay, great. And do we have other disciplines like nursing, public health? Okay, great. Well, I will go ahead and start then. And nothing to disclose. So my story starts in Nebraska. And uh, this, my great-great-great-grandfather um, immigrated with his two brothers from Switzerland in 1854 to Nebraska, and they founded this little town called Steinauer, Nebraska. Is anyone here from Nebraska by any chance? Woohoo! All right. And I don't know if I have a pointer, but you can see here is this is in this little county on the Kansas border. And um, the reason I'm showing you this is, first of all, it still exists. It's a very sweet little town in the middle of farms. There are three buildings in town um, other and a few houses. One is a bank, which is in the top left. One is a Catholic church, bottom right. And one is a, anyone want to guess? A bar, a tavern, <laughs> the Steinauer Tavern. And I want to bring this up because this Catholic church is the most conservative diocese in the entire United States. They were the last uh, to have all of the Latin, uh, uh, all of the um, altar boys speak in Latin. And they were also the last to allow girls to be altar boys. And in front of the church stands this. It's a memorial to all the babies that have been killed from abortion. Um, you can see 55 million unborn babies killed. So I just visited Steinauer last summer, so I took a picture of myself posing in front of this, because you'll see it ends up being a critical piece of my story, um, since you already heard about one of my big accomplishments. So this is where I come from. I come from a devout Catholic family. So I grew up, though, in Omaha. So Omaha, uh, in, 19, in the 1970s, I was born in 1969. Um, this is where you see Nebraska. It's right in the middle of the United States. And Omaha's on the eastern edge of Nebraska. I almost said coast. It's not a coast. <laughs> Although there is a, the Missouri River is technically right there. But, um, and so the, um, basically, uh, I had sort of a lovely childhood. I was the first in my family to who ended up going to college. Really supportive, nice, working class family. And... Wonder Woman became my superhero. So Wonder Woman, Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, as shown in this picture, aired between 1975 and 79. So I was between 6 and 10 when I realized that women have the power to fight evil. OK? And in this case, it was the Nazis that she was fighting. But it turns out Wonder Woman was like my hero. So anyone else in the audience really loved Wonder Woman when you were young? All right. OK. She lived down the street. You lived down the street from Linda Carter? Oh my God, okay. <laughs> so, and William Shatner, okay. Norma Jo lived with the movie stars. So, basically, you know, this was one of those things I really, I, I continue to collect Wonder Woman stuff, so this really, I, I make a joke, but I really am into Wonder Woman. And so, my goal is just as I tell you the story, I want you to picture your superheroes in your mind and I want you to find your inner superhero through this whole journey that you are in, okay? And it just, I'm gonna put on my own Wonder Woman cape right now. This is why I brought up my bag. <laughs> the rest of the talk. I'm gonna have my Wonder Woman cape on. So I want you all, I want you all to reach into your bags and pull out your super, superhero capes, your virtual capes, and put them on, okay? And I want you to think about what do you really care about in medicine? You know, is it, um, 
uh, cutting edge treatment for cancer? Is it making sure that homeless people have access to health care? What is your passion, okay, as you, as you go through this? Now, my family, while they hadn't gone to college, they were extremely pro-choice. And I found out later that my mother had given birth to a baby before me and had been sent to an Udred Brothers home to give her for adoption. And I found out that one of my grandmothers had a safe abortion in 1944 in Tennessee by a nurse. And I found out that my other grandma had gotten pregnant by my grandpa, Steinauer, who was from Steiner, Steinauer, Nebraska, and had had to get married because she was pregnant. And that was with my dad. So I didn't know this until well into my path. But basically, if there was one political thing my parents talked about in my family, it was that all women need access to abortions. OK. So then I left. I wanted to get as far away from Nebraska as possible. So I went to UC Santa Cruz. Um, anyone go to Santa Cruz? By any chance? OK, yes, all right. So at that time, UC Santa Cruz had no grades. It was just becoming possible that you could choose to get grades, but you didn't have to. So I chose to not have grades, and I just wanted to get away from Nebraska. So I did. And I became very involved in women's studies, learned what feminism was, totally changed how I thought about things, and became involved in the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center. And that really formed sort of my feminist grounding in medicine and decided then that I would go to medical school. So I went to UCSF for medical school, didn't go forward, um, between 1992 and 1997. Now, what happened, what was happening at the time was that, um, you know, abortion had been liberalized um, in the 70s, and there were a lot of doctors at that time who were so passionate about including abortion in their practice because they had seen women die of unsafe septic abortions. And what was happening in the early 90s is that there became a huge concern in medicine that these physicians were re retiring and no one was getting trained to replace them. Okay, so there were a number of things that happened. Um, this, uh, there was a 1990 symposium between the American College of OBGYN and the National Abortion Federation, which is sort of shocking. That really probably wouldn't happen now. I mean, maybe it would now, but it, it was sort of an unusual thing for those two organizations to work together. And their symposium was called, Who Will Provide Abortions? And out of that symposium came two commentaries, one by Phil Darney, who's my mentor, and one by David Grimes, who I know many of you know of. He's amazing. And basically just posing this question, What's going to happen? Um, also, there were a couple studies to look at whether OBGYNs were getting trained in abortion. In this study by Carolyn Westhoff and in this study by McKay, they found that very few programs had abortion training. So this became a huge crisis. And you can see that this is the proportion of ob -GYN programs that had routine training. So it had gone from the high 20% to 24%. And then right when I was in medical school, right when I was starting, McKay did the study to show that only 12% of OBGYN programs had abortion training. So this is sort of how everything's fitting together. It hadn't been published yet, but and I didn't know about it until a bunch of events happened. So about ten, more than 10,000 medical students received an anti-abortion mailing called the bottom feeder. And these were students who had been signed up through the AMA. And it was jokes, a book of horribly offensive jokes. You can see these are two of them. With a depiction of an abortion provider as someone, I don't know if you can tell, he's holding a cigarette in one hand and a knife in the other. And you can see that that smaller joke says, what would you do if you found yourself in a room with Hitler, Mussolini, and an abortionist, and you had a gun with only two bullets? You would, you would shoot the abortionist twice, is the answer. So here we were, just a picture for a second, first year medical students. We were really focused on anatomy, <laughs> physiology, kind of getting through the year, sort of figuring out who each other is, what group are we in, you know, all the usual dynamics. And this comes to our mailboxes. So this was really shocking. And one month later, Dr. Gunn, the first abortion provider to be killed, was murdered in Florida. And so this caused a huge wake up across the country of medical students who hadn't thought of themselves as potentially including abortion in their careers, 
but suddenly they were targeted. And not only were they targeted, but it was all the students who had signed up for the AMA. So I didn't get it, you know, because I was too radical for the AMA. But, you know, so, so one day these sort of mainstream, more mainstream students at the time came walking in with this booklet and they like handed it to the feminist group and they were like, look what we got in our box. This is horrible. And so it really galvanized a movement. And what happened then is a few of us sort of paused and said, well, wait a second. Are we learning about abortion? No, we weren't at the time. And then we learned about the McKay study that actually the proportion of OB-GYN programs had plummeted. So this caused us to start organizing. I'm losing my cape, it's making me sad. Okay, here it is again. All right, so we started organizing medical students for choice. Now, medical students for choice, um, you know, as you can imagine, started small. I think our first meeting we had like 30 students and now is in 32 countries. Let me just show you the map. Do you see that map that in the middle? I just took a screenshot of it, so it's not coming up. So yeah, 32 countries. Um, and in the United States alone, there are chapters at more than 150 medical schools. There are chapters at all of the schools in Ireland, for example. So this has just become a really a global movement. And I'm not involved anymore except to talk to the organization once in a while and speak. Um, but we, a group of us, started the organization back then in response to this crisis. Now, let me just see if there are any other pictures or anything. The ironing board is important for this meeting because there was an AMO meeting in San Francisco and we didn't have a booth at the AMO meeting, so I carried an ironing board on BART down to the conference center and we set up a little ironing board with our sign and we just organized around the ironing board, so I threw that in. Okay. <clears throat> so, this... The next step turned out to be really important. So as a result of ACOG and the National Abortion Federation and the academic world paying attention and the med students demanding curriculum change, the ACGME, which accredits medical schools, and you know, in this case, the GME, so graduate medical education, first passed in 95 and then implemented in 96 that all ob programs had to have routine training. And of course, what they, they have a clause that says a, a program or an institution doesn't have to do abortions in their institutions, and an individual resident doesn't have to do abortions, but it has to be available. And so what happened? Well, and let me just say that there is one little bit of evidence. So our first action as a group was to write the ACGME to ask them to change this policy to make it a requirement. And there's one bit of evidence on the web at the time. This was the Harvard Crimson interviewed Dr. G. Knapp, and he said that the council has also received several letters from medical students. So we sort of took that as like we were the main cause of the transition. So anyway, we felt very proud that we were acknowledged that our work had, had maybe contributed even a little bit. So after the ACG may change, you can see that the next two studies showed that about closer to 50% of ob programs had training. Partially that's because of the efforts of the Ryan program, which I'll talk about in a second. So I then did residency at UCSF in OBGYN. I did a family planning fellowship, and then I became interested in clinical and educational research. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, my focus now is mostly on educational research. I'm gonna talk about some of the work I've done too. So just now to talk about the Kenneth J. Ryan Residency Training Pro Program in Abortion and Family Planning. How many people have heard of the Ryan Program? There's a booth here. How many people in the room work for the Ryan Program? Where are they, are they here? Oh, they're not, they're probably at their booth. Okay, good, good. You should stop by and visit them. So this is an effort based at UCSF um, where we help ob programs integrate abortion training. Um, and I'm the research director, so I've done some of the studies to look at the impact the Ryan program has had. But we now have Ryan programs in 90 residency programs, um, representing more than one third of the programs. And so this is a map. All of the states that are in that kind of grayish green are states that don't have an ob residency program. So five sort of up in the middle west and then Alaska. All the other states have a program and all those in purple have at least one Ryan program. So there are a few states that still don't have one, but at least one ob program in each of those states has integrated abortion training. And we've, we've trained over 5,000 residents in these programs since the beginning. 
So we just did another study last year to see whether we've continued to have an impact. And it looks like asking the question in the exact same way as in previous studies, we've now gotten up to 80% of programs with routine training. And routine training really just means that it's part of the resident's schedules, but the resident can opt out. I wanted to also say a little bit about family medicine training. I'm not a family physician, but we've had sister movements in family medicine um, as well. Um, their requirements are not as strict. It doesn't say that all family physicians have to be trained to do abortions, but certainly all family physicians have to learn how to do pregnancy options counseling and referral. And then there's also advanced women's health competencies that do list early abortion within them. Yes. It doesn't surprise me that Norma Jo was involved in that advocacy work. <laughs> exactly. So basically, there is sort of a growing movement in family medicine to make sure this is integrated everywhere. And the program that's the sister program to the Ryan program is called Ready. And they've established 29 programs with integrated abortion and contraception training. Additionally, we now have the fellowship in family planning, and that's for people who have finished OBGYN or family medicine training, who then want to become a subspecialist in family planning. Um, and uh, we, have, we have about 30 programs, let me see if I have a map, yeah, 30 fellowship sites, and these just show you all of them. We also have one in Canada. So this is what's been happening in the academic world of ob and family medicine. We've made huge successes in uh, integrating abortion and contraception. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the studies that I've done. My, one of my main interests is in what is, not only what is the effect of being exposed to family planning training, but what is the, expo what is the effect on people who are uncomfortable with abortion or think that abortion's wrong. So, one of the goals in founding Medical Students for Choice was that we believe that no matter what a physician believes, that all graduates of medical school, medical school should have had some time to think about what they believe about different medical circumstances, including abortion, and are prepared to counsel women about pregnancy options and refer them, and have really thought about what is one's professional obligation, et cetera, but also figured out how to respect their own beliefs. So we've done some work looking at ob residents who went into the rotation planning to not do abortions, but yet were in the rotation. And so they had to observe counseling, do ultrasounds, et cetera. And we've shown in a couple studies that it turns out that this has immensely positive benefits. And the residents have loved the opportunity to spend time in the abortion clinics. Even though the vast majority of them still don't plan to integrate abortion, they value the skills for miscarriage management. They also have increased empathy for women who choose to have abortions, et cetera. So that's been a lot of my work. And the other thing I wanted to point out, which is really relevant to all of you in the room, is that one of the studies I did was looking at about 2,000 ob in practice to see what correlates with the choice to or being able to or choosing to integrate abortion into practice. So you could think about a lot of things that might affect whether one does abortions, right? They go into residency with an intention to provide or not provide, and that, of course, is affected by lots of things, like their past. Um, then they go to a residency program that may has training, maybe has training, maybe doesn't, and then they go out in the world, and we all know how the world is, but they could be in a place where the hospital says they can't do abortions, or they could be in a rural area where it feels stressful to do abortions, et cetera. And basically what we found is that the most important correlate of doing abortions after residency was going into residency intending to do abortions. So that was an odds ratio of about eight. So even if someone went to an ob program with no training or ended up in a rural part of the US, if they planned to do abortions before they started residency, they were more likely to do it. Okay, so that's part of the reason why Medical Students for Choices work is so important and why we really need to expose all of the medical students to comprehensive sexual and reproductive health. So let's see, some of the things that I've done, I've now been focusing a little more on curricular innovation, so I wanted to tell you about some of the work we've done. Um, and we have a website called Innovating Education um, in Reproductive Health. And did any of you here, we ran an online abortion course 
on Coursera, on one of the massive open online course platforms. And we had more than 7,000 learners participate in 150 countries. All of our materials are available on our website. So if you ever have sort of downtime in a clinical rotation or anything like that, you can actually just go and watch one of some of our videos. They're between five and 18 minutes long or so, and they're on everything from pregnancy options counseling to contraception to some fun ones on like how is abortion portrayed in television and the media. We have stuff on professional obligations and how to sort of grapple with your own feelings about abortion and sort of how to take care of patients in the most professional way possible. Oh, great. And it's linked to the website now. Great. And then just a couple more things is that um, we also have a bunch of materials on teaching about health disparities in family planning. So um, you'll see on the top left in the middle is Christine Dallendorf, who's giving the talk right after me, um, some really interesting lectures on how to think about health disparities and healthcare disparities. And then our most recent launch is a series called Explained. And this is very short videos. They're they're, we have a three minute video and a seven minute video for each topic. And it's a deep exploration by academics who are experts mostly based at advancing new standards in reproductive health about the impacts of restrictive abortion laws on women's health. So for example, mandatory ultrasound viewing, mandatory waiting periods, et cetera. And so these are very interesting and fun, and I definitely recommend that you watch them. So in conclusion, what I've, been try what I've tried to show you is that I feel very lucky that I sort of went into medicine sort of it was slightly delayed realization but i you know i was involved in feminism and women's health beforehand and then was sort of acutely w awakened um, in my first year and then was able to keep an eye on this passion you know that i had all through my training and i'm so lucky that now this is also my area of educational research i get to teach about this i get to take care of patients who are continuing their pregnancies or having an abortion or want to talk about preventing pregnancy so my wish for you all is that you find your passion and let that fuel you through your journey and so continue to follow your passions in whatever you choose and find your inner Wonder Woman or you, whoever you <laughs> honor. And you know, the new Wonder Woman, the opening night is in May. This is the new show called Wonder. So I hope to see you all at the, at the opening, the world premiere. I will be there wearing a full Wonder Woman costume. So thank you so much.